there are not a lot of developments in, in as far as oral medications in dystonia mm, they generally have limited utility and they're there are not that many on development uh however you know there are we have other mm, um things on development you know particularly botulinum toxin a new newer botulinum toxin and newer forms or ways you know of, of addressing our current neuro, neurotoxins that would last longer uh, or shorter you know, for for particular situations um, and that make them safer uh, we also have quite a few developments on the deep brain stimulation world and surgeries you know for for dystonia much more than we have in oral medications. Deep brain stimulation for dystonia evolved you know, from, from its success in, in Parkinson's disease and also you know, from older surgeries you know, or, or ablation surgeries you know, for dystonia. And uh, while it has not been applied to as many patients as for Parkinson's disease, you know, we have evidence you know, from class one studies in randomized you know, controlled uh, trials you know, for its use in generalized dystonia, but also in adult onset focal severe cervical dystonia uh, with evidence for its efficacy and safety. Uh, most people, when we lump them all together in the studies, you know, the average improvement is around you know, 60, 60%, 60 to 70% uh, in the motor rating scales. You know, there's also uh, known and demonstrated improvement in disability scales and, and pain, especially for those patients you know, with, with cervical dystonia. That is the the evidence that we have. You know, we for particular populations, for for example, for dystonia secondary to static lesions, like as in cerebral palsy uh, or other acquired forms. You know, the the evidence is not as solid. You know, most when most studies, you know, will will say that the improvement is about thirty uh, percent um, between twenty five and thirty percent, not clearly as good as in isolated forms. So there's a room there for for improvement, and there are some particular forms that tend to respond very well. For example, tardive syndromes, you know, severe tardive dystonia, uh, affecting whether it's the cranial musculature or arms or legs trunk, you know, tends to respond quite well to deep brain stimulation. So there, there's a lot of room for improvement because despite what I said about, you know, the evidence of, of its effectiveness, especially in isolated uh, dystonia forms, um, there there is a lot of unknowns. You know, even in the best case scenarios, you know, there can be up until 20% non-responder rate. Uh, that is a lot you know, for for um, undergoing a brain surgery. There is also, in, we're at the earlier stages of understanding, you know, what patients, you know, are really gonna do um, better you know with the surgery I mean we know that certain genetic forms you know, do do better than others for example dictor 1a tends to do very well myoclonus dystonia secondary to epsilon cyclooglycan variants you know tends to do very well and we know the ones that do not you know, for example rapid onset dystonia parkinsonism uh, tends not to respond at all so this is pointing us to a more um, precision medicine in this in this in this arena so one is the diagnosis the type of dystonia and then uh, another one is the in the device itself you know where in the brain you know, we know that pallial stimulation you know, tends to work well but has its limitations uh you know we have that non-responder rate in you know, sort of overall that applies you know to pallial stimulation we also have the fact that in some cases pallial stimulation at settings that are therapeutic for dystonia can cause some gait imbalance abnormalities some quote-unquote parkinsonism uh, that is stimulation related so that it goes away when you lower the stimulation but at the same time because it's therapeutic you know the benefit goes away as well so that's limitations of, of uh, palatal stimulation we also know that subthalamic stimulation also works you know for for dystonia uh, including genetic forms and it may act faster as far as the improvement of dystonia than palatal stimulation but also has a downside of the possibility of causing involuntary movements at therapeutic uh, settings as well the thalamic target you know has also been studied especially for very tremulous you know dystonia forms both in arms and and in upper extremity but has not been very well studied um, we uh, we've recently published a, a very small pilot trial on acquired dystonia in, using the thalamic target in, in patients in which the pilot target had been um, very affected or unimplantable and, uh, and shown 
similar uh, improvement as with the palatal target for this particular population. The investigation of newer targets, for example, cerebellar stimulation is, uh, is an avenue of improvement. And then another big piece is the uh, moving on you know, from open loop stimulation to closed loop stimulation, following a little bit what's happening in, in Parkinson's disease neuromodulation. And, uh, uh, and there are now quite a few, few groups, ours included, uh, looking at you know, what what potential neurophysiological biomarkers, you know, can be used, you know, to track uh, symptoms, but also to track stimulation, um, therapeutic stimulation in these patients that would hopefully make this therapy safer, more efficient, but also try to avoid, you know, those side effects, including the, the gait and balance issues, you know, with, with palatal stimulation. So um, overall, a very, very optimistic, you know, a future, you know, for, for neurodevelopments in, in dystonia therapeutics.